Hey guys, Casey here. I'm standing here with Chris from Grand Rapids Bicycle Company. Chris just did the Tiscobia 80, which is a winter fat bike race. Um, Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit about yeah. what the race entails? You bet. So the Tiscobia 80 is a, a winter fat bike ultra race. Um, a couple of different versions. There's the 80 mile race. There's a 160 mile fat bike race. The crazy people do 160 or 80 mile run. Um, which I can't imagine, but uh, this was the bike I used, um, Salsa Muckluck, and just a kind of a little bit about it. Uh, the race requires that you run reflective material on the bike, so I've got some reflective um, tape on the, on the frame and a little bit on the fork. Uh, they also require that you run two blinking lights in the back, one blinking light in the front, and be able to, and that you would have a, a front light that you don't have to run all the time, but that you could turn on as needed. Um, the other thing, uh, seat bag. Um, I'm using the Mr. Fusion from a company called Porcelain Rocket. The big thing with this is um, what I did was I had spare clothes in the back. Um, jackets didn't have base layers. That was a big, big, big mistake. I may probably get into it, but. Sure. 200 mistakes that I've learned a lot from <laughs> since, but uh, I care. I tried my best to carry uh, spare clothes in here. Um, in my frame bag, I had a, a stove. Um, the big thing with a lot of these winter ultras is there's a mandatory gear list. Sure. So with this one, um, not only do you have to have the reflective tape, the uh, the tail lights and the blinking lights, you've got to be able to account for at the finish of the race, spare batteries. So in my case, I was using six AAA batteries between my lights. I had to finish with six new batteries. Okay. So if you thought you were going to burn out, you had to carry 18. Um, the, so you also had to carry a stove. You had to be able to boil water. Um, and with this, this stove is an Esbit alcohol stove, um, alcohol tablet stove. So with it, you had to be able to carry a fire source. So I have a, a, a lighter. And then they required, if you were using an Esbit stove, to carry at least six um, Esbit tablets. And if you were going to, you had to finish with six Esbit tablets. So if you were going to use any of this material, um, you really had to carry more than that. I wasn't okay. planning on having to use any of it, so it didn't. I wasn't too concerned about it. Sure. Um, but you also had to carry 3,000 calories, and people got really, really creative with what they used for their 3,000 calories. I used a jar of Skippy peanut butter, um, which was like 2,700 calories, and then I taped a couple of Cliff Blocks packages to it, and it got me to like 3,100 calories. But you had to start with... 3,000 calories, you had to finish with 3,000 calories. So again, if you thought you would use some of that, you had to carry extra. Um, and they do that because of the conditions that you're riding in and because there are, you know, there's schmoes like me and then there's, there's pros and faster people that probably could do the 160 or the 80. You know, I think the winner did the 160 in 16 hours. Wow. In theory, they probably did with checks, checkpoints and everything, didn't need to really carry that gear. But there were some people who finished in 30 hours and maybe they would have had to. Mm -hmm. So they, they require that so that everybody's carrying the same amount of gear and that you can't just shed that gear off your bike in the last 40 miles yeah. and try to speed up. You, you do have to carry all of that gear the whole race for your safety and to even the playing field. Um, they require that you carry at least a zero degree sleeping bag and they really prefer that you have a negative 20 or a negative 40 bag. I was carrying a negative 20 bag. Um, they prefer that you carry a closed cell foam pad. Uh, the reason being is that it really blocks out the cold from underneath better than a air pad and it negative 20 negative 40 degrees trying to inflate a pad and deflate a pad does not sound like a lot of fun um and a appropriate bivy sack and essentially a bivy is just a big 
a waterproof cocoon that you sleep in, um, kind of like a sleeve to sleep in inside your sleeping bag. Um, I was using hoagies uh, with wool liner gloves inside, and these were super warm Revelate design hoagies. Uh, my, feet, my hands were actually um, kind of sweating inside of them. And I use a, a harness system from a company called Baryak. Um, really what it does is gets your front gear out away from your, your shifters and brake controls. Um, Salsa also makes a similar type product, but I like the Baryak. Um, and in my dry bag here, essentially what I have is my closed cell foam pad uh, underneath my sleeping bag, inside my bivy, and I roll it all up in, like a burrito throw it inside there so when I get to camp or if I have to stop I roll it out and essentially other than opening up the zipper um, my camp is, my camp is set up um, so uh, front bag here my couple of my bags here are from three toast threadworks local guy here um, I was carrying a little bit of snack food up here I sometimes have issues with asthma um, so I was carrying an inhaler up here but uh, um, just kind of whatever I thought I needed in the very, very short term up here. Um, the light system I had worked really well. Um, it wasn't a typical um, bike light. They really encourage you not to use anything rechargeable because in cold temperatures, um, your rechargeable lights will last a fraction of the time that you'll be able to get out of either an alkaline battery or preferably a lithium battery will, will last even longer. Okay. Um, so this is a nice system from, from, from Princeton Tech, but uh, gave me plenty of light and I had no issues at all with, with batteries dying or anything. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the big thing at the start was um, it was negative 16 air temperature. Uh, feels like of somewhere around negative 34. Um, and pretty, pretty cold. Pretty cold. Pretty cold. <laughs> so with that, what would you say are maybe for somebody yeah. that's looking to get into something like this? What would be your must-have items yeah. or really key things that you couldn't do without? Yeah, I, I've learned a lot. Um, I guess the short of the story was I was out for nine and a half hours. I only made it fifty-five of the eighty miles. Still very um, respectable. Thank you. Um, it was a when I quit. It was negative twenty-two and feels like of somewhere around negative forty. I was actually warm um, thermally. My hands were warm. Um, my my body was warm. I, I made some mistakes. Um, dry base layers. I didn't think to bring additional base layers. Um, thermal layers that I wasn't planning. I, I was thinking it was so cold, I wasn't going to have a problem with sweating out my gear, and I did. Okay. Um, I, I was using a wool balaclava and just a really inexpensive boiled wool hat from Outdoor Research. Um, saw a lot of really expensive headgear. This was like a $25 retail boiled wool hat that really was amazing yeah. keeping my head warm um so as far as like what what would i bring or what would you suggest um layers warm layers um gore or wind stopper layers um really key because even though it is so cold you're gonna sweat and that that sweat has to have somewhere to go I, as i found out the jacket I wore in the first half was a down jacket that got wet, wasn't breathable. The down wetted out, so I was losing any thermal insulation. Um, and actually, when I got to the first checkpoint, I took my jacket off and I had ice on the inside of my jacket, which was right next to my skin. Yeah. I was still okay, but it would have been nice if I had had some dry base layers to change into. Um, and that really became a problem later on into the day and into the evening um, when I did try to change out my jacket and some other, other clothes that um, I, I ran into a situation where I was afraid to take my jacket off because if my core got cold, it was so cold that you won't get warm I, again. I, I couldn't get myself warm again. Um, 
I made the mistake that uh, all my nutrition I was using inside of a hydration pack. Um, I didn't have any solid food with me. And I kept the hose from not freezing for the first five hours. And well, maybe the first seven hours. And then I changed out some gear um, and the hose froze within five minutes of me coming out of a place I was changing clothes lost all of my nutrition um, and uh, didn't have backup nutrition, didn't have backup water. And from there, it was just a <laughs> decline all, all in morale. Down. And I had uh, both of my Garmin rechargeable um, GPS units go out, uh, froze. They actually had battery power left. They just got so cold that they locked up and sure. froze. My phone froze. Um, so I ended up um, at one point it was dark. I couldn't see any lights in front of me. I couldn't see any lights in back of me. Jeez. I had no bearing GPS, you know, just to know if I was a quarter mile from an intersection or not that there was anybody there to pick me up, but my thinking was if yeah. I could get somewhere, maybe I could find a vehicle that could help get me to a town or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but no, no cell phone that I could call. Um, not that there was cell phone service out there anyway. Yeah, but that but, peace of mind was, was gone. Yeah, like I, and I wasn't panicking, but it did cross my mind. This is why they want you to carry this gear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, if you got yourself into a situation, you could at least start to boil water. You could get yourself into your sleeping bag and your baby sack and, and stay warm until somebody found you. Sure. Um, and actually where I bailed out, the next um, section up, there was a guy that they had to evacuate out because um, he was becoming hypothermic and they had to get an evac team in to get him out. Um, so it is, it's, it, it was a great event. It was a ton of fun. I'm obsessed with going back next year. I've been accumulating gear, the right gear, um, so I can go back next year and beat it. Um, but uh, it's, it's no joke. It's, I, I kind of I maybe went in without a true understanding of what I was getting myself into completely, but um, it was a great learning experience and yeah. something I'm yeah. really obsessed with going Absolutely. back to finish. Wow. I'm just going to show <laughs> yeah. up Chris's boot here, which is one of the kind of yeah, items the, needed to do this or something like this. Um, um, this is the Wolfgar boot from uh, 45 North. Um, it is not the warmest boot you'll ever find, but it's the warmest boot you'll find that you're able to clip in. Um, a cycling specific cycling boot. specific boot. Um, this one I have uh, replaced the stock liners with a liner from uh, a muckluck liner from Intuition. I battle with cold feet, cold feet in my couch at home, yeah. cold feet now, That's cold feet Most all people. the time. Now take that to into the negative 20s and I, I did battle cold feet and uh, yeah. essentially what I did was I would ride for half an hour I'd get off my bike and time myself if I walked for two minutes um, I could feel my feet warming back up and I'd get back on my bike and uh, ride for another half an hour and I was fine so these liners are something that I've bought since the race uh, this is one of the pieces of gear that seemingly is working so far um, but yeah it's everything everything is amplified we can't train we don't get yeah. that kind of cold temperature around here which kind of was cool yeah so with that how did um, how did you train for something like this yeah how did you test gear I mean was it just a matter of going out in different conditions mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about you some bet. of your training rides leading you up bet. to something like this. So I, uh, I live in northern Allegan County. Uh, very, very close to me is the Allegan State Game Area. Uh, lucky that the Allegan County Snowmobile Club grooms 90 miles of snowmobile road. Very, 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 very similar to what we were riding. The Tuscobia Trail, which the, the um, race is named after, is a, is a snowmobile trail in, in Rice Wake, Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Um, so it was once I got on the trail, exactly, you know, I was very, 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 very familiar with um, riding in sections that the snowmobiles had been through. 
uh, versus, uh, you know, off to the side where there was kind of a firmer line. Um, what happened to that snow during the day, during the sun, what, you know, it would set up differently at night. So that was actually a huge, huge benefit to know um, riding those trails all the time. Uh, you know, how to air, air your tires down, where to start them at, and um, that was a, a, a big, big plus. Sure. Um, so, but essentially all I did was um, I'd take off on Saturday morning, Sunday mornings, um, with my bike actually packed out um, and just go ride. And, uh, you know, it was a matter of shifting um, gear from one place to the other to make it ride nicer, um, getting used to adjusting tire pressure. I'd get out, let tire pressure out, purposely maybe set them up too soft so that I knew I'd have to stop in a little bit to air up because pumping your tires up in your living room is a lot different than doing it at, um, you know, negative, temperatures negative temps. And, and th actually we did that at one point. I, I was messing around with my tire pressure during the race, let a little too much out where all of a sudden I was working too hard to go slower than I was and had worked with my pump enough to know how to do it quickly. Yeah. You know, because at that temperature, if I took my hands out of my pogies, um, even for two minutes, they would get cold to the point where they hurt for the next 25, 30 minutes. In my pogies, it would take about a half an hour for them to get back to the point where they didn't hurt anymore. So you needed to be really quick and really deliberate about everything that you did. Yeah, and know what you're doing. And know what you're doing, when... practice it. You know, again, doing it in your living room is different than doing it in the cold. Um, even hunting for food, hunting for clothing, um, that was all stuff that I would stop. You know, I was really deliberate about where I had stuff packed in my bag, stuff I was going to need right away versus not right away. Um, and that was all stuff that I kind of practiced ahead of time. Yeah. Um, I didn't go out and practice boiling water. I, I probably should have. <laughs> um, but I did practice setting up my bivy and getting in my bivy and getting in my bag. And um, I was carrying a negative 20 mummy bag. I'm not... The smallest guy around so it was not too bad getting into it in my living room yeah but you get into it in, in the elements in the and elements you know and, and i could never replicate the negative temps i think you know 10 degrees was as cold as i went into but i, I just even uh getting into the bag getting into the bivy and just kind of laying there and, and yeah. getting used to laying in that bag and a little bit of claustrophobia so bivvies and i don't always get along but uh just kind of trying to the biggest thing is just getting the gear and tinkering with it and really knowing how getting, to use it getting or, really really comfortable with it outside of your comfort zone outside of your front yard and um you know that's kind of the fun for all of these trips it's it's the gear and what did you use? What did you not use? What would you bring next time? Yeah. What would you? Yeah. What do you wish you would have had? Um, one of the guys I went with, John Dupre, he uh, he was super super smart about it. He went to the race last year. He did finish this year, um, which was really really cool. He went to a butcher and had him make extra fatty sausage. Oh wow! Um, asked him to take the normal sausage blend, add fat to it. Um, no, and, and what turned out is it didn't freeze because the high fat content, it mm -hmm. stayed pliable. Okay. And just nutrition wise, he was eating fatty meat that his body was taking a long time to burn and it was super, super su sustainable for him. And, you know, I look back and think if my hydration pack hadn't froze and I had had some backup nutrition, um, could have been a different different it, story. It could have been because, like, I I, I was very dehydrated. Um, I, I realized about four and a half hours in, um, I maybe had only had 20 or 25 ounces of liquid. Definitely a lot, not enough, but, you know, you get fooled into thinking it's so cold. Mm -hmm. I don't have to drink. And, again. With the longer stuff, it's uh, it's not when you get thirsty or when you get hungry. You a lot of times it's it. it's before that. Um, to actually have it 
kick in and, yep. and, and be sustainable. Once you've bonked, it's too late. Yeah. It's really hard to recover from a bonk, even though, you know, maybe we were only going seven or eight miles an hour, but sure. you're seven, eight miles an hour with a 40 pound setup yeah. in snow, you know, it, it takes was, a lot out of you. It does. It does. And, uh, you know, that's where I think really, like I said before, training on the snowmobile roads and being used to what those conditions were like. It's very different from riding gravel roads, and it's really different yeah. from riding single track. And um, the conditions change. What we found was the first half was really wide. You could almost drive two cars on that snowmobile road. It was so wide. Um, there was always a good line that you could follow. And after that checkpoint, um, it narrowed down to a single lane, and there was a lot more snowmobile traffic on that section of the road. Conditions changed literally right after we left that checkpoint. Um, and that's when you know I started messing around with tire pressure and um, trying to do anything I could to eke any more speed out. And in that case, letting tire pressure out actually made it slower. Okay. Um, but that's how you learn, you yeah. know, like, yeah. so. Um, was there any, uh, we talked a little bit about nutrition, but was there anything in particular that you brought or use, um, any certain products that you prefer over others? Yeah, I, you know, I usually have really good luck yeah. with uh, Infinite Gofar. Um, I've done the 100 Mile Dirty Kanza a couple times, um, some other endurance events and a lot of training. Um, where I've never used solid food. I've, it's been enough calories, it's been hi enough hydration that even in 10 hour, 12 hour events, I, I don't need other food. Um, kind of thought that in theory it would get me through. As it turns out, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't drinking and, or, or taking in enough. Mm -hmm. um, and after four hours, I really could tell. Um, but yeah. The infinite stuff. So. Yeah. Um, I use a little bit of uh, these scratch blocks. Um, when I when I found myself really kind of starting to fade, I ate some of those and actually got a little a little pep. Um, I had a rider come up um, that had some hot water and um, that apple cinnamon scratch mix. Good that stuff. Actually, it tasted good pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Um, I did have a, actually a Yeti bottle, a stainless bottle with me that I was drinking a little bit out of and then I got to the point where um, the top froze okay. and my hands were hurting so bad that I couldn't, couldn't get, get it the open. top off anymore. And there wasn't much left, but at that point I considered um, you kind of make these deals with yourself, you know, like if I take off my jacket I'll be down to a couple of layers, but maybe I can take my hydration pack, move it to the front, put the frozen hose between myself and it, try to thaw it out, mm -hmm. um, and then I could start drinking and eating again. But then you think, okay, if I take my jacket off and I get cold and I can't warm myself up, then what What do I do? Yeah, I don't know where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I don't have any bearing to know. Again, I couldn't see anybody in front of me. I couldn't see anybody in back of me. Um, after a while, I saw some lights in back of me. And I, I kind of got off my bike and walked for a while, thinking maybe they'd catch up sooner, and they were farther behind than I thought. But once they caught me, I found out that the next town up was actually 10 miles up the road. So at about mile 65-ish. Um, and at the time I just knew I wasn't going to get to, I wasn't going to get another yeah. 10 miles. Yeah. Um, so I think from there I, I made it another five miles. Um, not, maybe not quite five miles. No, so, um, I guess, uh, you know, in closing, um, maybe any advice that you have for, you know, somebody that mm -hmm. maybe rides in winter or is, you know, has a little bit of experience under their belt, mm -hmm. maybe getting into things like that. Obviously they can stop into the shop and you guys sell all yeah. these great products that we talked about. Um, but maybe just things that you've learned, words of wisdom for somebody that mm -hmm. uh, is thinking about it or kicking around the idea. You know, for me, the big thing was um, 
I'd never done this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the thrill of it for me was totally being outside of my comfort zone. Um, I think it's good every once in a while to be kind of scared. Yeah. Um, and this this did it for me. And, you know, it's so it's okay to step outside of that, that comfort zone and be aware of what you're getting into, um, whether it's a bike race or a running event or something. Um, the thrill of preparing. I really only signed up a month before the race. The registration had been eight months earlier. Okay. I was lucky to get in, um, pulled some strings and, um, so I didn't have a ton of time to really fret or build up for it. I'd ridden, I felt a decent amount during the course of the summer that in, in one sense, the hay was in the barn. I was, nothing I was going to do in that month was truly going to fitness wise, get me any further along. Um, but there was a real thrill, um, and just preparing and getting the gear together and, going out on these rides by myself in the dark, in the cold, um, just really getting outside of your comfort zone and testing yourself. And, you know, physically is one thing, but that mental part of it and being able to push yourself when it's negative 22 and it's dark and you can't, you don't have any navigation. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine um, who does tons of these ultras the next week and he's like you know if you would have taken your garment and put it inside your pogey it would have warmed itself back up and i was like hindsight 2020 mistake number 201 yeah, yeah. um <laughs> but just stepping outside of that comfort zone and and putting yourself in an uncomfortable place you learn a lot about who you are and what you are and what you're made of and um, I think it would have been really easy to come away from this saying, I made it 55 miles, I didn't get hurt, I still have all my fingers and toes. Um, call it good. Yeah, big accomplishment. Big accomplishment. Itself. Great way to end the year. I think we, you know, the race was December 30. Yeah. Um, call it good. But it's really fueled but, this fire inside me that I've got a score to settle and I've you know, I've been accumulating gear and, and getting out on rides and not rides to get mileage in, but just rides to get out and test gear, yeah. um, jackets. And, you know, I've bought a couple of now more thermal, breathable jackets that I feel really confident I've got better gear now. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, that, that quest for adventure and that quest to get out and do something that you haven't tried before. Um, I think that's truly when you learn the most about yourself and what you're capable of. And for me, that's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's a healthy me, thing. It's got to be burning for something more. So good. Yeah. Well, we look forward to hearing about yeah. uh, round two and want to thank you for taking the time out to talk with us and, and show us the bike and yeah. the cool gadgets. So. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.